Good morning and welcome to the geopolitical arena of the ocean panel. On this day, Tuesday, November 17th, 2020, we are discussing oceans as a contested environment. My name is Jessica King and I'm the CEO of GeoSISU and an AGS fellow. I'm a geospatial intelligence industry expert, geographer, world traveler with two decades of experience with how geospatial data and technologies help us battle within contested environments and how it is leveraged to inform other instruments of power such as diplomacy, information, military, economic, and international cooperation. Ocean geographies are contested and will be increasingly so in the future. I'm excited to have some of the world's leading experts on the ocean sitting with us today. This passionate panel will take us around the globe to demonstrate this conflict. We will begin with each panelist walking us through maps of their current and future ocean topics and contested environments. And then we will move on to a set of questions. We will begin with each panelist walking us through maps of their current and future contested ocean topics. We will then move on to a set of questions. But first, I'd like to read through each of their bios of this fantastic panel today. First, we have Dr. Clive Schofield. Clive Schofield is professor and head of research, WMU Sasakawa Global Ocean Institute, World Maritime University, Malmö, Sweden, and professor, Australian Center for Oceans Resources and Security. University of Wollongong, Australia, he holds a PhD in geography from Durham, UK, and an LLM in international law, University of British Columbia, Canada. His research relates to international maritime boundaries, boundary dispute resolution, ocean governance, and technical aspects of the law of the sea. Next, we have Mr. Gregory Poling. He is a senior fellow for Southeast Asia and director of the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative at CSIS. He oversees research on U.S. foreign policy in the Asia Pacific with a particular focus on the maritime domain and the countries of Southeast Asia. His research interests include South China Sea disputes, democratization in Southeast Asia, and Asian multilateralism. Mr. Poling's writings have been featured in Foreign Affairs and the Wall Street Journal. He is author and co-author of multiple works, including The Thickening Web of Asian Security Cooperation, Deepening Defense Ties Among U.S. Allies and Partners in the Indo-Pacific with the RAND Corporation 2019. Mr. Poling received his MA in International Affairs from American University and his BA in History and Philosophy from St. Mary's College of Maryland. Next we have Ambassador Steve McGann. Ambassador Steve McGann is an international consultant and global security strategist and is the founder of the Stevenson Group. He has cultivated a team to help clients identify opportunities in the defense security sector and create specialized advisory services tailored to meet their needs. Formerly a senior foreign service officer with the rank of minister counsel McGann has held several influential positions in East Asia Pacific region, including United States Ambassador of the Republics of Fiji, Nauru, Kiribati, and the Kingdom of Tonga and Tuvala. He previously was the Deputy Commandant and International Affairs Advisor of the Dwight D. Eisenhower School of National Security and Resource Strategy at the, at the National Defense University. This is the last one, everyone. <laughs> Here we go. Dr. Karina Lorenz Morakovich was born in Brazil, where she studied oceanography at the Universidade do Estado do Rio de Janeiro and later received a BS in marine sciences from East Strasbourg University. She has an MS and a PhD in fishery science from Oregon State University. She has taught at Humboldt State University prior to arriving at Coast Guard Academy. The research of Professor Markovich draws from fishery science, environmental management, anthropology, sociology, and environmental economics with the underlying themes of understanding human impact to the ecosystem and ways to manage the ecosystem cooperatively and adaptively. Now we're going to, we're going to move into panelists with first being 
Dr. Clive Schofield, then Mr. Greg Poling, then we'll hear from Ambassador Steve Chan and Karina Markovich. Thank you very much indeed, Jessica. Um, what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is look at how coasts and oceans are increasingly contested, arguably, as a result of global sea level rise and particularly the impacts of sea level rise on the definition of baselines along the coast, the delineation of the outer limits to maritime claims, and on the delimitation of maritime boundaries between coastal states. Next slide, please. What I would say at the outset is that while this is a very much a geographical presentation and I'm a geographer uh, at heart, um, it is also something of a geolegal presentation uh, because we can't get away from the fact that maritime claims uh, are inherently governed by the international law of the sea and particularly the United Nations Convention on the law of the sea. Uh, at the same time, that convention is a very, very geographical one, as I hope to demonstrate. One fundamental legal issue that we need to take into account is that uh, the axiom in international law is that the land dominates the sea. That is, you need sovereignty over land territory in order to assert claims to maritime jurisdiction offshore. And that is done essentially through the baselines along the coastline. The land territory is represented at the coast by the baselines. What this means is that the normal baseline or the default baseline along the coast, in accordance with Article 5 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, is coincident with the low water line along the coast. This is usually generating a outer envelope of arcs for the particular zone of maritime jurisdiction, be it a 12 nautical mile breadth territorial sea or an exclusive economic zone limited by 200 nautical miles. We have known for a long, long time that the coastline is a dynamic feature of the landscape or indeed seascape. One of the key issues around baselines along the coastline is that we have known for a long time that the coastline itself is dynamic and can change over time. So while we may uh, define the outer limits to maritime claims from the coastline as it is today, that will generate uh, an envelope of arcs along the coastline, an outer limit to that maritime claim, be it a 12 mile limited uh, territorial sea or a 200 nautical mile limited uh, exclusive economic zone. States may be lucky, as it were, we may have deposition along the coastline, and as a consequence of that, the low water line along the coastline advances, and so not only generates additional land territory, but additional maritime jurisdiction over ocean spaces and potentially valuable marine resources. The concern we have in the context of global sea level rise, next, is that we will, and again, please, we will see a retreat in the coastline and therefore baselines along the coast. And as a consequence of that, not only will sea level rise impact on the extent of land territory and impact on valuable coastal infrastructure and urbanized areas, but also there will be an impact seaward and a potential loss of maritime space. What we have to remember though, as geographers, when we are looking at this type of issue of the impact of sea level on coastlines, is that it is very, very difficult to make global projections. Each uh, particular area of the coast will react to changing co uh, sea levels in different ways. There are complex, complex feedbacks between changing sea level and the morphology or shape of the coastline. And similarly, uh, particular coastal ecosystems will react to changing sea level in different ways. So what, we, what one might expect, next tap please, is if with, with a, a higher sea level, either a particular coastal ecosystem will drown or potentially it will migrate upslope. 
if indeed that is possible, given the degree of urbanization and pressure of development and infrastructure on the coastline, or for certain coastal ecosystems, such as mangroves, thank you very much, uh, we can see that there is an ability for those ecosystems to autonomously adapt to changing sea level and actually to remain in situ and build up their vertical location. Similarly, coral reefs have an ability to grow vertically uh, and potentially keep up with changing sea level. What is less certain, unfortunately, is how uh, coral reefs will be able to, to achieve this in a, in a warming ocean and also an increasingly acidic ocean. So what, what are we going to do? What are our response options? Well, in the context of a changing coastline, a coastline under, uh, that is increasingly contested and under pressure, probably the easiest thing in one way is to do nothing and simply to allow the coastline to adapt, uh, reach a new equilibrium with a, with a changing sea level. Unfortunately, that is uh, both practically and politically unpalatable um, because that, that means abandoning uh, areas along the coast which are extremely valuable. We value coastal areas. We've had a long term shift in population and concentration in coastal areas. So and we have mega cities around the world which are located on the coast. So our instinct usually is to try and defend uh, parts of the coastline. There's now well-established understanding that uh, in using hard sea defenses rather than natural systems, uh, we can end up with unlooked for and, uh, and unwelcome knock-on impacts from trying to protect parts of the coastline. Uh, we tend to starve other parts of the coastline of the sediment that it needs to uh, retain its stability. So another option that some cities have uh, taken up is to ad advance the coastline, to reclaim from the sea. And probably the premier example of that is Singapore from the uh, map you can see in the top right of your picture, uh, the pink shaded areas, is actually about 25% larger than it was three decades ago. And you can see the Marina Bay Stands Hotel floating up there on, on three skyscrapers. Um, is actually entirely located on reclaimed land from the sea. This type of response may be possible whether the land values are high enough to justify it, but it's difficult to imagine this in other geographical spaces. Next slide, please. So, for example, in the Arctic, in remote locations, long coastlines, where we have uh, large proportions of the coast which are unlithified, that's non-rocky coastlines, soft coastlines with a high ice content uh, and therefore susceptible in a warming world to slumping uh, and uh, to increased erosion, particularly in the context of a higher sea level and therefore a higher base for storms. And also in this context, we're dealing with coastline that has predominantly in the past been ice locked and there, therefore to an extent protected from wave action from that erosive action. And in the Arctic, we now have a record of an increasing frequency of storms and also an increasing intensity. So we have a situation of uh, parts of the, the Arctic coastline retreating, being eroded away uh, of the order of tens of meters per annum. So while the warming of the Arctic opens up uh, navigational opportunities, which we may talk about later, uh, it also has potentially uh, very severe implications for Arctic coastal communities, as you can see from some of the, the pictures from around the Arctic region. Next slide, please. Similarly, in the tropics, here we have uh, Kiribati uh, of the order of 3,000 kilometers from uh, east to west in three separate areas of exclusively economic zone. You see uh, pictures of uh, Tarawa, uh, which, is where, which holds the capital of, of Kiribati. Here we have tiny amounts of land territory uh, to protect and vast areas of maritime jurisdiction of the order of almost 3.5 million square kilometers of exclusive economic zone, but uh, less than 1,000 square kilometers of land territory. It is difficult to imagine sea defenses 
to try and protect these long ribbons of uh, atolls and uh, reef islands. But there are what I characterize as geolegal opportunities here. And uh, there's emerging practice which really shows the, the way in which geography and law in the maritime, in the oceans context come together. So there's increasing practice in the Pacific region for the states to essentially say, we have what we hold. Um, that is, they're declaring their baselines, their limits, uh, their maritime boundaries with neighboring states in what might be argued as excruciating detail. The example here is from the Marshall Islands in uh, 2016, where the Marshall Islands issued new marine legislation, which is only a few pages long, but the accompanying declaration is over 450 pages long. And the reason for that is that it's composed of very long lists of geographic coordinates, which define the, uh, the base signs, the outer limits to maritime zones, including all of the arcs for 12 and 200 mile limits in a huge level of detail. And essentially it's a geographical information systems file turned into text for the purpose of stabilizing uh, those baselines, limits and boundaries. Now, is this the way forward? Next slide, please. It provides one opportunity. You can see from the light blue shading on the, this slide, those Pacific Island states and territories which have defined those, uh, established those limits, declared them and deposited the information with the UN Secretary General through the United Nations uh, Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea. What, do you, what we don't know and what is a source of potential conflict in the future is the degree to which those declared, unilaterally declared limits are opposable to other states. Will other states, will distant water fishing fleets respect those limits? Uh, because we're seeing a potential break between in that legal axiom I mentioned at the start of the land dominating the sea. If the maritime uh, boundary that is dependent on a, an island uh, and the island disappears, will other states respect that boundary, which are uh, traditionally boundary, international boundaries for the sake of international peace and security are meant to endure uh, regardless of, of any other circumstance uh, unless the parties agree to, to change it. But uh, here we have a fundamental change of circumstance potentially, which could, may call settled boundaries uh, into question. And I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Thanks, Jessica. And thank you to the American Geographical Society and the other panelists. It's a real honor uh, to be here. And it's really nice to follow Clive Schofield, who's been kind enough to do all the legwork of explaining uh, maritime law so I don't have to. Let me just uh, play off of his presentation to discuss why, based on the complex rules of, of international um, maritime entitlements and the idiosyncrasies of maritime entitlements claimed in the South China Sea, why this really is the world's most contested waterway. So when we talk about the South China Sea dispute, what we're doing is using a misnomer. There are really two different kinds of disputes involved in the South China Sea. One is a maritime dispute over the rules, the, the customary laws that Clive Schofield just described how Southeast Asian states and China are to divide up the waters, the seabed, and the airspace of this waterway. The second dispute is over territory, over the islands and reefs that dot this waterway, and that is a historical sovereignty dispute that predates UNCLOS, and that is largely irreconcilable, at least in any reasonable time frame. What I'm showing here is a map of the first dispute. So what you see are all of the Southeast Asian parties making maritime claims based on UNCLOS. Now, some of those may or may not be excessive, but they're made within the framework of accepted international law. Each state claims a 12-mile territorial sea. Each state claims a 200-mile nautical mile exclusive economic zone and a continental shelf seabed rights to at least 200 miles and in many cases farther. This would already qualify the South China Sea as one of the most contested waterways in the world. But on top of that, we have the Chinese and Taiwanese claims, which occur largely outside of the framework of UNCLOS. China does claim a 12-mile territorial sea, an EEC, a continental shelf. It also claims 
some type of ill-defined historic rights throughout the entirety of what's called the Nine Dash Line, which you see here. Taiwan has a similar claim, though it's not entirely clear that it actually claims the same historic rights China does. In as any case, the farthest limit of this Nine Dash Line extends about a thousand miles from the southern coast of China. It's actually closer to Australian territory than it is to Hainan. Uh, China has, since at least 1998, baked into its domestic legislation the idea that in addition to everything allowed at under unclose, it also gets historic rights. We know that at least it covers fishing. It covers all oil and gas resources, which raises the question when in history China was engaging in deep seabed oil and gas drilling in the South China Sea. It covers the right to restrict foreign military activities, including joint exercises with the Southeast Asian countries in their own waters. It claims uh, law enforcement rights and so on. Basically, whatever China decides historic rights means is what historic rights seems to mean on that day. This is where the interests of third parties, the United States, European parties, Australia, Japan are involved, not in uh, wonky historical arguments over who first administered what rock, but over the rules of the road that govern the passage of ships, the rights of freedom of the seas in the South China Sea. And since at least 1995, the U.S. State Department has regularly issued statements declaring that China's claims threaten fundamental principles of international law and violate the rights of third parties, including the U.S., to freely operate in the South China Sea. Now, the situation is made yet more complicated because you do have an interaction between the territorial dispute, which I'm showing here, and the maritime dispute. There are four contested island groups within the South China Sea. The northernmost, Pratas Reef, has been occupied by the Republic of China on Taiwan since the end of the Chinese Civil War and is still claimed by China, by the PRC. Scarborough Shoal, uh, a little over 100 miles from the coast of Luzon in the Philippines, was effectively under Philippine administration until 2012 and has since been under control of China. The Paracel Islands, the smaller of the two main island groups located south of Hainan, has been occupied in its entirety by China since 1974, when Chinese forces drove South Vietnamese troops off of the half of the islands that they occupied. But it is still claimed by both Taiwan and Vietnam. And then in the south, you have the real morass, the Spratly Islands, in which no country had anything close to effective administration, I mean, until the French and the Japanese started bickering over it in the 1930s. Today, you have... Uh, occupation by the Vietnamese of at least two dozen and up to 27 reefs, depending on how you count. You have eight islands occupied by islands, if they are above water at high tide, at the very least generate a 12-mile territorial sea of their own. China would argue that they also generate their own exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. Now, the Philippines brought China before an arbitral tribunal under Anglos which in 2016 issued an award that said, no, none of the islands, at least Scarborough Shoal and in the Spratlys, are uh, capable of sustaining human habitation, which is the requirement under Article 121.3 of UNCLOS for an EEZ. So as far as international jurisprudence is concerned, the Spratly Islands and Scarborough Shoal generate 12 mile seas. The status of the Pratas is less clear. It is arguable that one perhaps up to three or four of the paracels being larger than those in the Spratlys could generate their own EEZ and continental shelf. Regardless, what you end up with is a waterway that is effectively impossible to map. Trust me, I, I've tried. Uh, that's most of what we do. There is simply no way to accurately depict maritime claims in the South China Sea in a way that is either clear, readable, or acceptable to all the parties. What we know is that you have some level of ill-defined claims from islands that overlaps with a much clearer coastal series of claims from the Southeast Asians. And then on top of everything is the Nine Dash Line. This is, is China's uh, you know, catch-all. Anything that I can't figure out how to claim based on my coast or the islands, I also claim via the Nine Dash Line. Now, none of this is new. Uh, the claims over islands date back the better part of a century. The claims to waters have been steadily spreading since the 19, late 1970s. And China's claim to historic rights has been baked into Chinese law since the 1990s. All of that was a inconvenience. Um, it was something to be managed and de-escalated. 
but it never really rose to prominence until 2009. And what we've seen over the last decade plus now is a new cycle of escalation. Starting in 2009, when China responded to extended continental shelf claims made by Malaysia and Vietnam by providing the nine dash line as the demarcation of its claim. The first time China had ever submitted to a UN body the nine dash line and said, this is my claim. Prior to that, it had largely been an academic exercise. That kicked off a series of escalations, all of which we don't need to go through. But when we get to 2013, this culminates in a fundamental change in the status quo and a real challenge to key components of international law, including UNCLOS. So when the Philippines decided to take China to arbitration, as I earlier mentioned, China responded by greenlighting a massive engineering project to expand its seven islands in the Spratlys. China had been the last to get there in 1988. It had gotten the worst real estate. By that point, everybody had already occupied all of the real islands, islets, and even the rocks. So what China did was occupy seven mostly or entirely underwater reefs. This is Mr. Reef, the last one that China occupied in 1994 off the coast of the Philippines. None of it is above water at high tide in its natural state. Under the rules of UNCLOS, it is a piece of the seabed. It belongs to the continental shelf of the Philippines. That didn't stop China from building a small outpost on it in the 1990s. After China decided to begin building islands at the end of 2013, this is what Mr. Reef became. And the situation is similar across all of China's outposts in the Spratlys. In the course of about two years, from December 2013 until late 2015, China built 3,200 acres of new land in the Spratlys, as well as a few hundred more in the Paracels where it expanded existing facilities. In order to make that 3,200 acres of new land, China dug up an estimated 15,000 acres of pristine coral reef. And clam harvesters from Hainan, which preceded the dredging boats at every one of these reefs, destroyed an additional 25,000 acres. So China intentionally dug up 50,000 acres or more of coral reef in the world's most uh, biologically diverse marine habitat, spewed it on top of these reefs, created islands where there had been none before, uh, and now would claim that these islands are fully entitled to maritime zones under UNCLOS. Now, all of this was already settled in a sense by the 2016 Arbitral Award. Mr. Free, as far as international law is concerned, is still underwater. UNCLOS is quite clear that islands are naturally formed pieces of land. They are not artificially created. Mr. Free is the world's largest artificial island, as far as international law is concerned, and entitled to nothing more than a 500 meter safety zone to make sure nobody bumps into it. Although even then, the fact that it's actually an artificial island in Philippine waters means that the Philippines gets to decide whether or not it has a 500 meter safety zone, not China. Uh, China's other facilities may or may not be entitled to 12 mile territorial seas. So what we face now is a fundamental problem where not only was the dispute already remarkably complicated, arguably irreconcilable, but now we have uh, a, a set of rules that's been made quite clear and which are so far apart from the claims being made by Beijing and perhaps the claims being made by Taipei, Taiwan is a bit mum on this, that it's getting harder and harder to see compromise as a realistic possibility. Um, the more the the more China clarifies its claims, as it's been doing since the 1980s, the smaller the space for ambiguity becomes. The harder and harder it becomes for China to figure out how to equate its historic claims with with the the legal claims that that the rest of the world uh, abides by. And the more that international jurisprudence points out how illegal China's claims are, again, the smaller the space becomes. So I worry that we are getting to a point at which it will become politically impossible for China to uphold the rules of UNCLOS, because there will simply be no way to bring its now wildly excessive maritime claims into even nominal compliance with international law. And that becomes very dangerous, because once the space to equate those two disappears, increasingly it looks it will look to Chinese leaders like the best course of action is to abandon international law altogether. And I'll wrap up there. I'm really pleased to be part of this today's discussion on the Pacific. Uh, we've often talked about the Pacific as a region in conflict, but I think we need to take a step back and understand that 
the people of the Pacific, Pacific Island countries, uh, have always lived on what I call the outskirts of human security. Uh, there are challenges in uh, Pacific Island countries uh, that have been underway for some time. Pacific Island countries, uh, for instance, have uh, troubled economies, uh, very restricted in the sense that they're heavily dependent upon uh, fisheries, tourism. Uh, there's been uh, a long history of Pacific Island countries being underserviced when it comes to uh, health care, for example, food security. And when you add to that uh, the challenges of the negative impact of climate change, which of course has not only contributed to rising sea levels, but also, most importantly, it's also contributed to uh, an increase in natural disasters, particularly cyclones. Uh, and they're coming with uh, greater frequency uh, and ferocity. And then when you pull all of these together, of course, we have the current coronavirus pandemic, uh, which has exacerbated all of the problems in, in the region. And I think we always have to focus on the fact that Pacific Island countries uh, on a per capita basis receive the greatest amount of development assistance than any particular region. Uh, I, I recall when I was ambassador uh, to Fiji and five other countries in the region that that uh, per capita development assistance added up to almost $17 a person. That is not an indication of the generosity of countries. It's also an indication of, again, the challenges that Pacific Island countries face. Now we are in a situation adding to these challenges that the Pacific region is also a region in competition. Competition between uh, the United States and, Ch and China uh, primarily because of the growing uh, aggressiveness of that competition, uh, particularly as seen in Chinese activities uh, in the South China Sea, which is the far west of the Pacific. But we also have to understand that uh, China's engagement with Pacific Island countries uh, actually occurred because, not because of so volition so much on the part of China, because China did not, when it began the uh, Brick Road Initiative, think that it was going to end uh, in New Kukulotha, all right? But China was very uh, good at filling vacuums created by Western countries. Because China's actually only interest in the Pacific uh, in the beginning was a diplomatic competition between uh, Beijing and Taipei. But with, again, with uh, the new openings uh, in the region caused by the vacuum created by uh, lack of engagement or insufficient engagement by the United States and other countries, we then see it saw a larger problem. And what does that larger problem lead us today? It leads us to a situation in which the United States in particular is looking at uh, increasing its military presence in the region. What is going to be the impact of that military presence to Pacific Island countries? We don't know yet, but one of the things that we do know is that if the United States and its allies are going to be building new military platforms in the region, those platforms also have to contribute to the sustainability of Pacific Island peoples. All right? uh, we have to make sure that uh, Pacific Island countries have the sufficient skilled and semi-skilled labor. Uh, they have the technical capabilities uh, to support uh, these new platforms. At the same time, while those platforms exist, it's gonna be incumbent upon the United States and other countries, again, to address the human security needs of the region. Those human security needs are acute. If we don't address those needs, then in fact, what will happen is that what is a competition in the Pacific will become attenuated to the point that it would resemble conflict. Because what will happen is that, again, the sustainability 
of Pacific Island peoples will be hampered by the new vulnerabilities that are now in the region. Rethinking maritime governance in the battle against illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing in West Africa. So this is a research that's in collaboration with Professor LaMonica of the Coast Guard Academy, and we also had some cadets uh, participate as well. Next. In West Africa, fish represent the single most important source of animal protein. It's a way of life for the coastal communities. And our research focuses on Ghana and Senegal. And you can see this in, in this picture that those are some of the areas that are the darkest there in West Africa, where the fish consumption is about 23 to 25 kilograms of fish that um, the population rely on per person per year. Next. Senegal has a, a very productive um, um, fisheries with a population of 12 million people and 20% of the labor force um, and 10% of the rural population rely on fishing sector to provide employment and income. Uh, these activities provide about over 600,000 jobs. And unfortunately, the declining number of fish and in their waters have led them wanting to leave Senegal. Next. In Ghana, over 200,000 jobs are directly related to fisheries and about 2 million jobs are indirectly related and seafood provides as much as 65% of their protein. Most of the fish supply is from artisanal fisheries as you can see in some of the, the canoes in the upper um, pictures there. While we also have some um, purseiners and some larger scale fisheries as well. Next. So over the past decade, numerous studies have concluded that uh, West Africa fishers are experiencing dramatic decline in catch per unit of effort. So in this uh, graph on the left, you can see the number of canoes going up in the 90s for about, uh, from about 4,000 canoes through about 14,000 later in 2018. Uh, while the maximum sustainable yield would be only 9,000 canoes to actually allow the fisheries to be conserved. And um, the, the, the Coastal Resources Center of the University of Rhode Island has been doing extensive work in Ghana. Next. And they found that, um, in fact, in our um, conversations with the Ghanaian scientists, Last year, they found that there was a complete, there would be a complete uh, collapse of the fisheries by 2020. And um, yeah, so it, it's a dire situation for the, for the country of Ghana and Senegal as well. Next. So here we see that there are several sectors in the fishing industry in both Ghana and Senegal. In Ghana, small scale fishers have long dominated the fishery sector and they, they are about 80% or 90% of the fisheries in Ghana are using what we call canoes. And they fish about six nautical miles and beyond but the number, size, and technological sophistication of those canoes are continuously growing. So they use um, all kinds of technology to be able to catch fish and go further. The trolling vessels on the bottom here, you can see they're trawlers. They're often owned by foreign interests who on the surface appear to comply to, with local laws by registering their vessels locally and hiring about 75% of the crew. They also don't report a lot of what they catch. So it's definitely an underestimate. And in purple here, you see the uh, purseiners and the purseiners are usually um, a joint venture between Ghanaians and Chinese, Koreans and Russians and their landings have increased considerably. So those large vessels come into and sometimes illegally into the closer to shore and take the fish out of the, the small scale fishermen. Next. So the problem is three pronged. Uh, we have weak maritime governance which cannot address the depleting fish stocks, which leads to food insecurity and maritime crime. Next.
So IUU fishing is a comprehensive term that refers to a variety of activities that violate or are unregulated by the conservation and management measures established under international and national laws. So about 37% of all fish caught in West Africa is considered illegal or unreported. And this is really an underestimate. And what we saw is that some of the types of illegal fishing include using dynamite to catch fish, using light night fishing at night, using chemicals to stun the fish. You can see on the right, uh, top right, the monofilament nets, those are illegal, uh, but they are used. Um, a lot of catching and landing bycatch. And I want to call your attention to transshipment. So transshipment is referred to as psycho, where the large foreign-owned trawlers catch species that are not permitted to land. So they work with the artisanal fishermen who adapt their vessels, um, such as the one in the upper left there. You can see a hole in that vessel. In that, 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 so it has an empty compartment. And they go and buy the fish from the trawlers, which caught, then they caught that fish illegally. And then they are sold illegally back to the local communities. And then under Ghanaian law, uh, the minimum penalty for a vessel caught transshipping fish is about a million dollars. Yet cycle fishing has become so profitable that it's extremely pervasive with Ghanaian fishing communities today. In fact, these cycle fishing canoes may also be involved in other maritime crime activities such as drug smuggling, weapon tra uh, weapons uh, trafficking, human trafficking uh, to and from the fishing vessel. So. All this leads to what Garrett Harding has characterized as the tragedy of the commons. Next. So it's widely accepted that by many maritime strategies that food insecurity can lead to maritime crime. In this figure, uh, we use data from the um, International Maritime um, Bureau to actually plot the number of criminal activity such as pirate attacks in West Africa in most recent years. Um, so poorly managed fisheries do in fact directly and indirectly lead to greater, more insidious crime activities and a general weakening of maritime security. So this manifests, in, manifests itself into violent attacks by foreign industrial vessels on domestic artisanal vessels, IUU fishing, forced labor and, and slavery, territorial disputes. So you can see that um, the green and yellow uh, dots here represent some of the activity in the Southeast Asia. And then you also have in the early 2000s. And then more recently, since 2016 or so, you have the red dots more in West Africa. So it's the activity is moving from Southeast Asia to East Africa to now West Africa. Next. So one way to alleviate the overfishing problem is by not allowing fishing to occur during the most productive season. So closed fishing seasons are not favored by fishermen, as you can see on this sign on the upper left, no fishing, no vote. So uh, next. Our goal with this study then is to identify the elements for implementation of a closed fishing season comparing the efforts of Senegal and Ghana and then to provide a legal framework for successful fisheries management in West Africa. Next. Using historical examples of successful close fishing seasons elsewhere in the world, we hypothesize that uh, West African country would require an effective legal framework pertaining to the maritime domain, the requisite maritime assets for enforcement capacity, and strong political will from the government uh, for enforcing those laws. Next. So Senegal has uh, closed fishing seasons have been relatively successful compared to many other countries in West Africa. And they started implementing their own closed fishing seasons, one community at a time, one species at a time since 2009. But Ghana has had several unsuccessful attempts, um, one more recently actually this year. And, and although upwelling strongest in August, and the scientists would then recommend the close fishing season to be in August so that the fish could actually reproduce. 
and replenish for next year. The season rarely happens during the August month because the politicians are pressured by the fishing communities to close the fisheries only in the least productive times of the year. So I'm going to be talking about a success story in the Denso um, Delta River that we visited last year. Next. So um, this program is part of the Development Action Association funded by USAID and it's headed by women. And those women teach how to collect oysters. They teach about basic science of oyster habitat and reproduction market. They test environmental variables, as you can see in some of those pictures, and they monitor the status of the oyster over time. So they collaborate on making decisions on how to manage the fishery, including permits, including habitat, monitoring the habitat conditions. Um, they use uh, some of the male fishermen would use traps and therefore they would destroy the mangroves. So the women go and replant those mangroves. And, and they have been relatively successful, as you can see in this picture on, on the top left, uh, there was a cadet that came with us last year and, and the sign there says, okay, this is our closed fishing season. So the results have been encouraging with larger growth of oysters and improved livelihoods. Next. So this is a picture of our group uh, when we were visiting the Navy and the Maritime Police Headquarters in Accra, Ghana. Both Ghana and Senegal have enough legal mechanisms to combat the problem as through policy diffusion, their domestic laws essentially replicate the international communities. The main difference between the two countries is that co-management is part of the legal framework in Senegal, but not Ghana. So co-management is simply the sharing of responsibilities between the government the scientists and the community in making decisions and it does help improve compliance. Next. So when we were looking at um, maritime enforcement, uh, we looked at the maritime, mar military balance report from stable seas and, and it combines data from different areas to assign subscores to a country's difficulty to patrol an area maritime domain awareness, coastal patrol assets, and naval capability. And as you can see, Ghana has 66 out of 100, Senegal 69 out of 100. And compared to other countries, they're considered relatively doing relatively well. As you can see in this picture on, on the left, uh, the, the countries in blue and, and darker blue are doing relatively better than the other countries in terms of um, maritime enforcement capacity. Next. So the most difficult aspect to measure is actually political will. It's very qualitative, but it is central to achieving policy change. Political will is the genesis for which laws and enforcement are built upon. So we looked at vari variables such as maritime domain awareness, which is lacking in Ghana, where most of the efforts are given to oil, while Senegal fisheries is considered uh, more important. The subsidies are important in both countries, but we saw the subsidy dependence in Ghana in exchange for votes. Policy diffusion is prevalent in West Africa where countries internalize uh, international policies as their own, but Senegal uses something we call bioregional approaches because they take into account local characteristics and that has been more successful. The rent sinking behavior display, displayed not only by Ghanaian politicians, but politicians throughout the continent shed light on the link between foreign fleet contributions to the growing fish stock crisis and IUU fishing solutions. So the foreign countries payments to coastal African nations in exchange for fishing rights in their EEZ stifle the adaptive co-management solutions that we have been proposing for them. But Senegal has been making more progress because they use co-management approaches and they're more democratic. So and part of it, it is actually part of their legal framework. So Ghana lacks the political will. And therefore, um, we believe that that's one of the reasons why Senegal has been much more successful in implementing those closed fishing seasons. Next. So a common theme uh, from our case study for both Senegal and Ghana was the importance of co-management. 
Uh, Senegal boasts a strong fisheries co-management system today, which is driven by continued political will to eradicate illegal fishing and capable, well-funded maritime enforcement institution. The Republic of Ghana lacks not only the political will to eradicate illegal fishing, but um, the appropriate adaptive system of co-management as well. They tend to resolve their, their any kind of violation through uh, alternative dispute resolution, so therefore their violations are not enforced very well. While um, in, in Senegal, they take the enforcement capacity a lot more seriously. Next. So expanding the scientific, technological, and law enforcement approaches may alleviate some of the fisheries issues in West Africa. Currently, Ghana does not have what we call MPAs or marine protected areas, but there are five in Senegal shown in the figure on the left. The marine protected areas provide areas for fish populations to be able to reproduce and grow. So in addition to the close fishing, by utilizing MPAs, Ghana could have more success in pr protecting its fisheries. Um, we plotted around the Senegalese MPAs, uh, the Automatic uh, Identification System or AIS vessel traffic data, which could be used to aid fisheries law enforcement capabilities. So when we went to Ghana, we saw that the monitoring control and surveillance team tracks per seiners and their activity using AIS and cameras. So they are already embracing some of this technology. Next. So in order to improve fisheries management, food security and maritime security in West Africa, strategies need to be adaptive in the face of uncertainty monitoring the environment and social components as feedback loops, informing future policies. They also need to be bioregional, taking into account local knowledge, scientific knowledge, and adapting policies based on characteristics of each region. And the knowledge um, needs to be shared and in a cooperative, cooperative fashion in order to increase ownership for decision making. And you can see here some pictures taken in our trip to Ghana. And um, the women work as food processors, both in Senegal and, and Ghana, and market the fish and take care of their families. So their role is crucial because they add value to the fish uh, through processing. In Ghana, the women are often ma marginalized groups who do not participate in the decision-making process, while in Senegal, a powerful woman figure has improved fisheries management in the country. So the picture on the left was taken at a fish processing facility run by women funded by USAID. Here, here the women receive uh, courses on fisheries conservation, hygiene, and fish processing. And the picture on the right was taken at a local school in Ghana where the mothers work in a nearby fishing processing facility while their children receive care and education. So we believe, again, that this, this approach of adaptive, bioregional, and cooperative management can definitely help um, both Ghana and Senegal, as well as other countries in West Africa, and helping conserve their resources and prevent some of the maritime and security issues that we've been um, experiencing. Thank you. Now, thank you, Karina, for that fascinating presentation. Now we will be moving into questions. So our first question of the day is I'm going to ask Greg, for each of your issues, which U.S. government agencies, other nations' governments, and international organizations do you feel have the most sophisticated geographic understanding and thoughtful grasp of the issues at play? Well, I mean, increasingly over the last 10 years, uh, pretty much everybody with a Navy and a commercial fleet has paid attention to the South China Sea. So it's no longer just the claimant states, it's the US government, the Japanese, the Australians, uh, the UK, the French, the Indians. Uh, the, the, how sophisticated the grasp of the details are varies widely, um, largely because maritime domain awareness, the ability to monitor these waters is relatively poor, except for the Chinese who can see and hear everything that moves in the South China Sea. So on the U.S. side, uh, I mean, obviously, Indo-Pacific Command, U.S. Coast Guard, uh, there's a pretty good sense of the geography over at the National Geospatial uh, Agency, NGA, and 
I would assume you have similar grasp of the geography in, say, the UK, um, France, where you know they were the first to chart most of these islands. The Japanese, uh, the claimant states themselves are a bit iffy when it comes to what's a rock, what's an island, what's above water, and what isn't. Um, as Clive could attest, given that he had to uh, submit expert testimony in the Philippines arbitration on the case to tell them what was and was not a rock and an island. And even then, at one point, the Philippines pointed him to the wrong reef and identified it <laughs> under the wrong name. So, uh, like I said, it's the world's most contested maritime geography. And uh, after over 100 years, people still aren't entirely sure which rock is which. Excellent. Thank you. Clive, did you have any anything you'd like to add to this question? Any comment? Thank you very much indeed. I, I, would, I would simply amplify uh, uh, Greg, Greg's comment there in terms of the, the mystery of the, the South China Sea appears to be an enduring one. Even the, the seemingly simple question of how many above high tide features are there in the South China Sea seems extremely hard to pin down depending on which state you have in, in question. And part of that comes down to the issue that, as Greg indicated, you have exploration of these features by different states over different time periods. And therefore, you have different toponyms, different names for each of these features and different ways of counting uh, a particular feature, whether it's uh, uh, several detached coral reefs, whether you give them one uh, geographical name or whether you whether you count them as, uh, as as different names there's a huge element of confusion uh, there what I what I would say though uh, in relation to which institutions have the the, the knowledge of uh, uh, features um, in particular for my topic area uh, for my own presenta presentation related to to sea level rise impacts on baselines uh, limits and boundaries. I'd have to go to the international level and to think about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, also the, uh, the UN systems level bodies of the International Hydrographic Organization, International Seabed Authority, uh, uh, and the United Nations Division of Ocean Affairs and the Law of the Sea. But if I circle back to the uh, South China Sea context uh, that uh, Greg was referring to, uh, what I really would suggest uh, is that he is being somewhat uh, modest uh, in relation to the knowledge that uh, uh, is a repository in his own organization uh, and the Asian Transparency uh, Initiative, uh, because uh, uh, the team that Greg heads up have produced some fantastic uh, repositories of, of, of data, but also tremendous graphics to back that up. Uh, in terms of the cartography, he, uh, I, I was a little bit tickled during his presentation that he, he seemed resigned to the fact that he was unable to actually map the South China Sea. Uh, well, I, I don't think that's entirely true because you can find a, a plethora of maps uh, uh, on his website. But also I would refer anyone who really interested in these issues to look at the judgment, uh, the award that came out of the, the arbitration be between the Philippines and China, uh, because, because that's uh, a judgment of about just over 500 pages or so, uh, which uh, is a very detailed and rich source of information. Uh, and in the absence of China in the proceedings, uh, the tribunal itself commissioned research to inform itself uh, ahead of delivering its judgment. So that's a that's a rich source in itself. Thank you, Clive. I'm, I'm going to move on to the next question, and this is for Ambassador Steve McGann. Steve, in your view, what are the top three contested oceanic geographies that are the common and unique political, economic, and military issues? associated driving the contested environment? Thank you. I think we have to keep in mind that uh, Pacific Island countries are being drawn 
into the confrontation in the South China Sea, not by their own volition, but because of the fact that the United States and its allies requires a forward-leaning strategy uh, to deal with the South China Sea. As a result, Pacific Island countries find themselves amidst this uh, U.S.-China competition, not necessarily because of requirements to meet the Pacific Island countries' own security needs, but in fact because they were essentially bystanders on global and regional uh, confrontations. We have to keep in mind that the Chinese encroachment uh, in the Pacific actually uh, started because of the competition between Beijing and Taipei over diplomatic recognition. It wasn't because Taipei had, excuse me, Beijing had a vision that the Brick Road Initiative would somehow end in Tonga or Fiji, right? And that the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and other allies uh, in very many ways created a vacuum that allowed China to fill. And so unwittingly, or rather unknowingly, uh, Pacific Island countries were drawn into the conflict. But this conflict also still does not address the ongoing needs of the region. Uh, Pacific Island countries are particularly concerned about uh, fisheries protection and poaching. Uh, and of course, these are still activities that are undertaken by countries such as China. Uh, they're also concerned about the negative impacts of, of climate change, right? But so the, the region is in conflict, but the region is not necessarily in conflict because of the national security needs of Pacific Island countries, but because of the security requirements of other countries. Yet at the same time, the biggest challenge for Pacific Island countries is not national security, it's still meeting their human security needs. Because in the Pacific, we are still faced with uh, not only the negative impacts of climate change, we, we have to deal with economic dislocation, even exacerbated more by COVID. We have to deal with the fact that even in some of these Pacific Island countries, youth suicide is at a higher ratio in Pacific Island countries than anywhere else in the world. So the problem is how do we deal with these human security needs of the Pacific Island countries, and at the same time, the national security requirements of large powers. Really great insight. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. I also want to ask the same question to Karina. Karina, I'll, I'll, I will um, read the question again. Um, in your view, what are the top three contested oceanic geographies and what are the common, unique political, economic, and military issues associated driving the contested environment? Okay, thank you. Um, no, I would agree that uh, some of the most contested environments would be the East China Sea, uh, South China Sea, and also I would add perhaps Atlantic um, ocean, Mediterranean Sea. So uh, what, what I believe they have in common um, in terms of political would be lack of clarity um, and lack of international and inter-agency uh, collaborations. In many of those nations, there's a very weak maritime government, which then has a hard time dealing with some of the issues such as uh, fish scarcity, climate change, and in the case COVID exacerbating everything. Um, I also believe economic, there's a feedback loop between food insecu insecurity, all the human security that was discussed, and maritime and territorial insecurity. There are a lot of pervasive incentives in a lot of the countries for corruption and crime. And uh, militarily, it's very difficult to deal with um, some of the violent non-state actors such as criminal organizations. We see issues with piracy, we see uh, issues with um, human trafficking, uh, drug trafficking, um, and that all adds to the complexity of those uh, very difficult um, challenges. Thank you. Thank you. My next question is for Clyde. The question is, it's around a new territory. We're really focused on the China Sea. So I want to kind of change our, our place on the globe and talk about the Northern Sea Route. So my question to you, 
the Northern Sea Route has arguably been become economically, militarily, and politically contentious due to climate change. What role should the U.S. play in this geography and why? Um, well, thank you for that question. Uh, that's that's uh, we're, we're certainly taken us a long way away from the South China Sea in one sense, but in an, another sense, uh, there is a unifying factor here for uh, the United States. Uh, the United States has, as the world's strongest maritime power, has long had uh, a fundamental interest in freedom of navigation. Uh, and this goes to the, the issue that uh, uh, Greg mentioned in terms of the South China Sea being one of the most contested and busiest uh, waterways on the planet. Uh, a key interest for the United States in the South China Sea is around ensuring uh, that there is continued freedom of navigation uh, through that waterway, which is vital to the, the global trading economy. Similarly, that applies to all other international waterways, including uh, what are in legal terms called, termed uh, straits used for international navigation. Uh, so in the Arctic context, that would be the Northwest Passage through the Canadian Arctic Archipelago and uh, the north northern shoreline of Alaska. Uh, but uh, for the Northern Sea Route, uh, for the arc over uh, the Russian Federation and Siberia, um, that is again an area where, or a route that is increasingly free from ice in the, uh, for an extended summer period, uh, and therefore is increasingly being used for uh, commercial traffic. And there is a, a deep-seated interest on the, on the US side. Uh, now, I am uh, an Australian living in Sweden saying this, but nonetheless, um, the, the, the United States has an abiding interest in freedom of navigation uh, through international waters globally, not simply in contested areas such as the South China Sea. Thank you, Clive. I also wanted to ask Karina this question as well as her role as a professor at the Coast Guard Academy. Are you guys focused on the Northern Sea Route? And you know, what role should the U.S. play in this geography and why? Thank you. So I think our role um, should be to improve partnerships with the member states, but also with the tribal communities in the region, um, just to ensure a peaceful and stable maritime governance in the Arctic. I think uh, developing maritime domain awareness is um, because our knowledge is still very rudimentary. Uh, we need to understand the operational risks to try to overcome some of the communication gaps in the Arctic. Uh, such as poor propagation of radio signals, um, also um, enhance our capability of operating in the Arctic. We need to increase our icebreaker capacity, scientific research, um, to help establish a capability infrastructure for search and rescue, for example, operations in the traffic, because as you increase more tourism and shipping and so forth, um, you, you increase the need for search and rescue operations, environmental protection, there will be more oil spills, law enforcement, uh, maritime securities, and so, um, and, and in investing on scientific research, because right now our understanding is still, uh, there are still a lot of uncertainties, so we need to be very adaptive in terms of um, our understanding and monitoring of the environment, learning from the environment, running and, and, and learning from our policies and strategies, providing feedback to, for future changes. So I believe um, those are some of our strategies um, moving forward in the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Greg, did you have any, any additional yeah, yeah. thoughts around this, this, uh, this question? I do. <laughs> I think one of the things that we have to do when we look at uh, uh, issues regarding maritime security and freedom of passage, we also have to keep in mind that the concerns of Pacific Island countries also uh, spill over into those areas. And primarily, they're concerned about the status of their exclusive economic zones should some of them uh, sink beneath the waves. This is not just uh, an issue 
uh, concerning income, that is income from fisheries license and things of this nature, but it's also an issue about the survivability and identity of Pacific Island peoples and their culture. And I think that is, if we start looking at these type of issues, we have to look at them in the context of how can we frame national security issues in the same context as to what's good for or what's of interest to Pacific Island countries. And, and so continue to have a discussion on the status of, of economic zones, should they, should these countries such as Kiribati and Tuvalu uh, sink beneath the waves, would be a first step in having a universal or at least a consistent approach toward maritime security in the region. Thank you, Steve. Greg, do you have a perspective on this question as well? Well, let me pick up uh, on what Steve got at. And I think some of the things that, that Clive addressed in the beginning of his presentation, right, which is that, that many of these areas, whether it's the South China Sea, areas beyond national jurisdiction of the Pacific, the uh, Northern Passage in the Arctic, what we're seeing are pressures at the seams of accepted international law and unclose, you know, issues that were left either purposely ambiguous or not addressed in case of, in case of uh, climate change because they just weren't considered. And so the, you know, the regime of international law is not entirely settled. We do have developments around uh, rising sea levels, shrinking baselines, around uh, fishing rights and, and protection of freedom of the seas beyond the limits of the EEC. We have ongoing challenges to establish regimes, both by China and the South China Sea, potentially by the Russians in the Arctic, by seemingly Turkey in the East Med. Uh, you know, we have these ongoing debates um, still about military activities in international straits, in the territorial sea. We have issues that were decided by razor thin margins at Unclose 2, um, or not at all at Unclose 2 in the case of of uh, innocent path by warships, but that the the way that the U.S. and most of the Western world interprets it probably doesn't actually have majority support. And so what we are presented with is, is a situation in which um, players like the U.S. who are just not engaging with the system right now are seeding the field as new norms and rules are being set. And in a place like the South China Sea or the Arctic, uh, what is effectively likely to happen if the U.S. and others don't engage in that, that competition for ideas is just unilateral declarations. Um, you're already seeing that with China and the South China Sea. I suspect you will continue to see excessive kind of shelf claims made in the Arctic over the coming years as, as exploitation becomes more probable. Um, I mean, we've already seen that arguably from the Canadians. We might well see it from the U.S. someday. Nobody knows what the U.S. kind of shelf is in the Arctic because we won't ratify UNCLOS. So, we should just keep in mind that these, yes, we have a great deal of accepted jurisprudence when it comes to the oceans. It's not a full picture. And there are still horizons that need to be explored. And the U.S. is not part of that exploration right now. Thank you. That's great insight. My next question is for Ambassador Steve McGann. When you listen to the political and policy dialogues about these issues in the U.S. and elsewhere, do you feel as though they are grounded in the real ge geographic realities of the situation? And in addition, do American citizens seem to know the ocean geographies that are contested? And what is the stake for the U.S. in this region? I think it's important uh, to understand that the situation in, in the Pacific is actually grounded in two realities. The realities of, of the security needs of the United States, and again, the realities of the human security needs of Pacific Island peoples. And that there seems to be a lack of understanding on the U.S. part as to what are the needs and or desires and requirements of the peoples of the region. And I think that has to be addressed first. Uh, far too often, uh, we even still uh, talk about the Pacific as a theater. And when you speak to Pacific Island peoples in those terms, they're quite confused. They say, what theater are you talking about? Uh, because the region is not a theater to them, but it's their home. It's where uh, they engage their livelihoods. So I think there has to be uh, an understanding of the, uh, the nature of the region uh, by the United States, as well as 
uh, listening closely to its key allies in the region, Australia, New Zealand, and to a certain extent, uh, Japan, and look at how they work with Pacific Island countries in a much more constructive way. Uh, far too often, uh, the United States uh, has a tendency to be very narrowly focused and uh, thinking in terms of, again, we need new platforms in the region, but we also don't focus on how do we make these platforms sustainable by building capacity in the region to uh, deal with the economic and social welfare of Pacific Island people. So somehow there has to be a convergence of these two notions, all right? And, and I think if we do that, uh, our approach will be uh, that's that much more well-grounded, although we're talking about a, a region that's predominantly water. <laughs> so. Clive, do you have any perspective on this question that you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, it, absolutely, I would, because the, the, admittedly I'm coming to it from a, a, so a more Australian perspective, if you will, but the, the question was, re was really around uh, how citizens think or the general public thinks about oceanic issues. And I think the reality to that is that in general, they don't. Uh, we're still very much land-based animals. We have a, uh, a, a degree of sea blindness. And if I, uh, in a formal conference uh, context, can tell a joke, there's an old joke within the Australian maritime community uh, there's a line in the Australian national anthem that says that uh, Australia is girt by sea and the joke in the maritime community runs that it should really read it's girt by beach because our horizon, our vision of, of uh, the, the ocean is uh, pretty much as far as we can serve. Uh, we have no conception of the scale. I mean, uh, uh, Professor McGann was talking about the Pacific the scale of the maritime jurisdiction uh, and the entitlements of the Pacific Island states is equivalent to the, the area, the surface area of the moon. We're talking an enormous area in maritime terms. These are traditionally uh, termed small island states, but they are undoubtedly large ocean states. And the narratives within the Pacific community uh, is to conceptualize their maritime jurisdiction as the Pacific Blue Continent. It's a wholly different way to perceive uh, of the value of the oceans when uh, for our own uh, first world Western uh, perspective, uh, another, another um, anecdote I, I'd say is that I, I heard a, a, a head of a port authority in Australia say, well, the average Australian thinks that everything arrives on a truck, when in reality, 99% of, uh, of imports arrive by ship. Uh, our perception is closed off to the oceans. That doesn't extend, of course, to the policy level within uh, the United States or within the, the, the Western European states or Australia, but certainly on a, on a public level, our perception of the, uh, the importance of the oceans is somewhat constrained. I do think on a positive note to, to end my intervention that this is changing. Uh, our, un, our interest in and understanding of both the value of the oceans and the increasing value of the oceans that are usually under coined under a banner such as the blue economy is enhanced uh, than where it was but also our understanding of how much that the oceans are in peril. And uh, the, the assistance of David Attenborough and the uh, you know, uh, documentary series uh, such as his give us a, a much better perception on a broad basis as to the, the value and vulnerability of the ocean. Thank you. Yes, could, I, could I address this, this question? I, I just, you know, I, I really like the way it was framed. You, you asked whether or not Americans are familiar with these contested geographies, and I, I would argue that not enough, but I think more Americans are familiar, at least notionally, with the South China Sea and the Arctic and the Persian Gulf than they are with their own waters and, in fact, their own territory. I mean, the United States 
uh, body politics notoriously geographically illiterate. We don't teach geography in most public schools. The vast majority of Americans don't know the extent of the U.S. territory, right? They don't, they might, I would hope, be familiar with Puerto Rico and, and Guam and maybe American Samoa. They, most Americans don't know where the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands is, much less that it belongs to the United States. They don't know what the three freely associated states are, much less that the U.S. is responsible for their defense and, and much of their foreign policy. They don't know that the vast majority of the waters and seabed claimed by the United States are not off the U.S. mainland. They are off our Pacific territories. Uh, they don't realize that the Obama administration declared the world's largest maritime preserve, and most of it is based around uninhabited rocks that Americans have never heard of off the Hawaiian Islands. And so there is this vast space over which notionally the United States exercises sovereignty or sovereign rights, over which it is responsible in one of the world's largest EECs, and 90% of Americans, myself included, who, you know, got an advanced degree in international relations, had no idea what these things are until I started running a program that forced me to map the world's oceans. Uh, so I'm a little less worried about Americans knowing what's going on in the Arctic. I would much rather Americans know what's going on off their own shores. Well, other than their Arctic shore, I should say. That was a great perspective. Um... Karina, do you have anything you'd like to add to, to this question? Sure. Um, coming to, to this country um, very young, first as an international student, I noticed the lack of uh, geographic knowledge of um, American students, but also taught in the history classes where I, I believe that it was very self-centered. So I think um, we need to expand the, the perception of um, American students and young that there's more than this country. I, I think that we need to expand um, foreign languages here because the, the people around the world that know more usually about other countries and geography and importance of that, they speak more than one language. Um, also, traveling more, usually expanding their horizons to other countries and understanding cultural diversity and empathy for other cultures. I think it all comes at a young age. So I think um, to put to to actually put more importance in geography, geography, geographical knowledge, culture, and diversity it would really help us move forward in, in the direction of being more well-rounded. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. I have one last question for, for each of the panelists. Um, I'll start with Greg. Um, if you were to have a vote in the framing of each of these contested environments for the incoming administration, what maps and data would you bring to the Oval Office to make your case and why? Well, obviously, I would start with the mapping database at, at the Asian Maritime Transparency Initiative. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, so in reality, I think one of the things that really needs to be put on uh, the desk in the Oval Office uh, for any new administration is the map of the U.S. claimed exclusive economic zone, the map of the potential continental shelf of the United States, particularly in the Arctic, which it is not able to claim because it is not a party to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and therefore does not have access. The U.S. President, a map of all of the deep seabed mining concessions that have been handed out to mainly Chinese, but also some European and Japanese companies, for which American companies are not able to bid, despite the fact that the only reason we have not ratified UNCLOS is because the Reagan administration was so worried about U.S. companies not being able to bid on those. And so what the Reagan administration, in fact, did was guarantee that only Chinese companies could win those concessions. These might seem like selfish maps to pull out, but if you think, as I do, that one of the most important things we need to do is ratify UNCLOS, then we kind of need to shame U.S. administrations into it. Thank you, Greg. Clive, would you like to interject? And we'd love um, to hear your perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I think Greg said it, said it very well indeed. I, know, I think this, this question comes back round uh, neatly to the question of contested geographies. And the obvious way we could answer that question is, well, from Greg's perspective, South China Sea, South China Sea, South China Sea, or in a traditional geographic sense, you, you mentioned the Eastern Mediterranean, you mentioned the East China Sea, but where I, I think he hit the nail on the head is around 
the way in which particular aspects or regimes, particular geographies within the oceans are increasingly contested. I, I'd say that from a thinking from the sea level rise impacts point of view, talking about contested coastlines and therefore the impacts on uh, limits and, and maritime boundaries. Uh, but I'd also think in terms of the emergent issues that are coming uh, to home to roost that will be more and more contested in the future. Seabed mining, as Greg mentioned, that we have the acreages are, are defined in the, in the international seabed area by the International Seabed Authority. And we have uh, a range of uh, major companies uh, and, and countries interested in those areas, but we have no commercial seabed mining taking place at the moment. But the, the legal regimes there are increasingly under pressure. Uh, we have an ongoing negotiation about the preservation uh, or conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. So we have, in a way, a tension between the desire to exploit and the desire to conserve, uh, and also an overlap, a complexity, an interplay between national regimes of sovereign rights for continental shelf and exclusive economic zone, uh, and those areas beyond national jurisdiction, uh, the, the so-called commons, uh, the high seas and the deep sea, deep seabed, uh, international seabed area. So in addition to our traditional concerns over uh, uh, straits, over navigational rights, over uh, the definition of islands and their entitlements, um, we have a range of new and emergent pressures on the system. And as uh, uh, Greg mentioned, many, much of the terminology within the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is ambiguous in character. It's lowest common denominator language that is designed to reach general consensus agreement on a package deal. Much of that terminology is inherently geographical in character. And it, while it's the law of the sea convention, it's a very geographical convention. And really the, the interpretation uh, of those provisions and reaching understandings of how the interpretations can move forward is a role that geographers can play a major, major part in. Thank you, Clive. Thank you, Clive. Real perfect. Okay. Ambassador McGann, what is your perspective? I'll read it one more time. Um, if you were to have a vote in framing of each of these contested environments for the incoming administration, what maps and data would you bring to the Oval Office to make your case and why? I think the first thing I would bring to the Oval Office uh, is a map of the Pacific that emphasizes that the United States is a Pacific country, right? And that our objectives in the Pacific can be best met, not unilaterally, but through multilateral cooperation and engagement. And, and not just with uh, our uh, allies, uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and, and Japan, but we have to look in terms of how we can work with partner countries through the multilateral institutions that they've already created. I'm thinking in terms of the Pacific Island Forum, the Secretary of the Pacific Community, uh, the Pacific Island Development Forum. These are uh, organizations uh, and activities that would allow the United States to engage in a dialogue with Pacific Island countries and so that we would be able to merge the national security requirements of the Pacific with the human security needs of the Pacific. And, that, and in that way, we could have a much more holistic uh, approach toward our engagement to the region. And one that is not just uh, focused uh, react in, a, in a reactionary way to uh, Chinese encroachment, but one that is more undergirded by U.S. constructive engagement throughout the region.
Thank you so much. Karina, did you have a perspective on this? What would you bring to the Oval Office? So I, I would bring a map of the world and showing how interconnected uh, it is through the ocean uh, and how much of the world is, uh, the, the ocean comprises the world. And without understanding the diversity, territorial claims and conflicts, how difficult it is to address some of these issues. In this map, I would show all the countries that have ratified UNCLOS and how the United States is one of the very few ones uh, who still need to do that. And um, that ratifying UNCLOS would bolster American legitimacy in international maritime affairs beyond uh, what it's already able to do. And how the U.S. has one of the largest um, exclusive economic zones in the world, and, and that protecting it and uh, through rat ratifying UNCLOS, um, how that's so important. So that would be my map, my map of the world showing its importance, the EEZs, and the fact that the U.S. is one of the very few countries that hasn't rectified UNCLOS. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to all the panelists for your valuable insights. Could, could I just, oh, in, yes. sorry, could I just intervene and say, and actually say what map I'd bring to the Oval Office, uh, yes. which I didn't actually do. Um, we can, I, I guess it's another job for Adam to splice in. In terms of uh, a map to bring to the Oval Office, I'd probably try to bring two. Firstly, uh, an interactive map illustrating how much maritime jurisdiction is under threat from a recession in the coastline as, as, as a consequence of sea level rise. And secondly, a map that not only indicates the breadth of national maritime jurisdictions, including those of the United States, but how much is beyond national uh, maritime jurisdiction. The, a map indicating the areas beyond national jurisdiction or ABNJ to give an impression of the sheer scale of the areas that are part of the global commons and are therefore uh, worth protecting and are of value to uh, the global community in terms of the negotiation of a new instrument uh, that is legally binding on the global community to protect the resources and environments there. Thank you. Sorry thank to you cut you off, Jessica. No problem. Thank you, Flat. Um, I'm going to I'm going to thank each of you for your valuable insight today on oceans as a contested environment. As the global citizen, geographer, and traveler, this has been a very valuable conversation, and I'm very excited for the results of this this panel today. So thank you to everyone, and thank you to AGS.